listening to the Thoughts from a Page podcast. My name is Cindy Burnett, and I love to talk about books. I am so glad you are listening and would really appreciate your rating this podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you have personalized book questions, I can be reached at Cindy H. Burnett at att.net, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Today, I am interviewing Fiona Davis. Fiona's latest book, The Lions of Fifth Avenue, is the Good Morning America's book club pick as well as Veranda Magazine's. She began her career in New York City as an actress, where she worked on Broadway, off Broadway, and in regional theater. After getting a master's degree at Columbia Journalism School, she fell in love with writing, leapfrogging from editor to freelance journalist before finally settling down as an author of historical fiction. Fiona's books have been translated into more than a dozen languages. Welcome, Fiona. I'm thrilled you are here to talk with me today. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. This is terrific. Of course. I always enjoy your books. You're some, they're some of my favorites. And this actually is my very, I love all of your books, but this is my favorite. So I'm really excited to talk about it. Can you tell me a little bit about The Lions of Fifth Avenue? Sure. So all my books are set at landmark New York City buildings. And this one's set at the New York Public Library. And it's in two timelines. The first is 1913. And that's from the point of view of the wife of the superintendent of the library, who lives with her husband and two children in an apartment in the library that actually existed. And she is surrounded by all this knowledge and all these books, but she wants something more out of life. And so she applies to Columbia Journalism School and suddenly her world is really cracked wide open. And the other timeline is 1993. And that's from the point of view of a curator of rare books called Sadie. And she works in this rare book book collection called the Berg Collection, which again is an actual collection in in the library. And she's putting on this big exhibit and it means a lot to her and her career. And a rare book goes missing. And she's drawn into a series of book thefts that occurred 80 years ago, as well as a tragedy that happened to the superintendent's family back then. And I like to say it's about the magic of the written word and the power of women's voices. I loved all of that. I think that's probably why the book resonated so much with me. Strong females, books, the New York Public Library. I was completely fascinated with this apartment. So what happened to it after, I mean, they lived there. I mean, I know a real family lived there. Your story is a fictional family. But what happened after the, the family that lived there moved out? Is it, was it an apartment for a long time? Uh, so the family lived there. It was, it was John Fiedler was his name. And he lived there with his wife and three children. His daughter was actually born in the apartment in the library. The kids would play baseball using books as bases in the (laughs) reading room (laughs) until they got caught. Right. And and they were there for 30 years. He he finished in 1941. And after that, it came storage and offices. And I was lucky enough to get a behind the scenes tour and get to see it. It's not open to the public. And it's right on the Southern courtyard. So they faced this inner courtyard. There were these huge windows. And it was this beautiful seven-room apartment, which in New York is valuable real estate. Why did it not continue as an apartment? Do you know? I think they didn't need a a live-in super anymore. A lot of the libraries here in New York had them, even the smaller ones, because you needed someone to keep the furnace going. And and so, yeah, so, so a lot of the libraries here in New York do have old apartments in them. But at a certain point, I think things became automated and you just didn't need someone living there full time. And so they could definitely use the storage, I'm sure, as time went on. That's so cool that you got to tour it. Was it really neat to see? Oh, it was just great. It's up this kind of secret stairway in a way. And and they were just so lovely to to be able to let me in and show it to me. And and I just found so much inspiration. There were a couple of things there that I won't talk about because it'll give away the plot that I thought, oh, I'll use that. And, and it was off and running. You know, the other question I had for you is the missing manuscript from the 1913-14 timeline. Is that an actual thing? Is that, does Poe have a missing book? No, I, I, he does not have a missing book, but there were book thieves back then. And there were some wonderful books on these book thieves that occurred through all of the, the 20th century. And so I found a lot of inspiration from that. The actual book theft that occurs in Lions of Fifth Avenue is inspired by one that happened at Columbia University's Butler Library, where they had $1.8 million of rare books and manuscripts go missing over a period of three months, and no one could figure out how the thief was getting in and out. And so I used that as sort of my my framework for, for my own theft. 
I think I remember now we hosted you for conversations from a page last fall. And I think you were talking a little bit about that now that you're saying that. And then I saw when I was looking through the acknowledgements, you referenced that article and I'm actually planning to go look it up. I'd love to read more about that Columbia theft. And I think you talked at the time too about Yale and maybe some of the other places that had also had thefts. They just didn't have security and we're not expecting all of these things to be targets of theft. Yeah, it's so interesting because especially in the rare book world, you can't just go into a, a, a map room or, or even the Burke collection. You have to prove that you're a scholar, that you're doing research. So people are really vetted, which is why it's just a huge betrayal where, when one of those people, which is what happened at Yale, is in there and, and they you know, very carefully sliced out maps from old rare atlases and tuck them away and walked out with them. And, and it happens a lot. And it's just terrible because it really is destroying a piece of Western history and culture by, by doing that, by taking apart an atlas or stealing a rare book. You're doing such damage to scholarly research. Well, and slicing a page out of a book also, you know, you can't, it can't go back into the book like it once was. So you pretty much are destroying the book, even if you've just taken a page or two out of it. Exactly, exactly right. So where did you get the inspiration for this story? We just talked about the theft part of it, but what about the apartment and the library and and the rest of the story? Yeah, so, you know, I I got the inspiration to to choose the New York Public Library after doing author talks around the country and and having so many readers come up to me and say, hey, how about the New York Public Library? I couldn't, I just couldn't ignore it anymore. And I I did research and once I, I discovered an old New York Times article about the apartment and the the superintendent retiring and and I just thought oh that's perfect to have an to have a family living inside that's when I knew it, it it would work and from there I just did a ton of research into the building the construction book thefts at that time and thought okay if I set it in 1913 it's 2 years after the building's open so it's up and running and then 1993 when when it's changed a little bit you know the times have changed and women's roles have changed And I just thought that would be a good way to highlight how things have changed and how they happened. Well, I think it's the perfect book. I just absolutely loved it. Thank you. So as you walk around New York City now, writing these books about these different iconic buildings, has it changed your view of just walking down the street in New York? I mean, are you constantly looking like, I wonder if that would make a good story? I wonder if that would make a good story? Oh, definitely. Because, you know, here in New York, there's just layers of history and ghosts in in every building. And yeah, and you're seeing it change so quickly as buildings are torn down and replaced. And so the ones that are still standing, I'm just so curious to know what went on. I joke around that by my 30th book, I'll be doing the gas station on the corner of 11th Avenue. Do you keep a long list? I mean, do you sort of keep a list of some ideas and then pursue them? Or do you just usually kind of find your next one and think this is it? I find I can only do one thing at a time. So juggling multiple ideas would would make it hard for me to stay focused on what I'm doing now. I find that I, I as I tail off in the, into the editing mode of a book and it's finishing up and wrapping up and ready for to go off to the publisher, I just start raising my antenna. And, and every time so far, and this is the fifth book, something jumps into and, and makes me think, okay, let me just explore that. And every book, every building that I've explored, I've found something to play with. And so I, I think, that, again, there's so many possibilities. It's almost overwhelming. And I'm very open to suggestion. Well, I was going to say, that's the other thing. I didn't really realize people had suggested the New York Public Library to you, but you probably get all sorts of suggestions all the time. And that's probably helpful, too, thinking about things maybe you hadn't originally considered or a building you maybe didn't know about. Yeah, exactly. And, and often people will send me a building with some piece of, of their family's history with it, that their father worked there or... No, their mother lived there. And that's so interesting because then you get a real sense of the, the lives that went on within it. Especially if you have photos and stuff to see exactly what it looked like. Yes. Yeah. Very helpful. <laughs> what surprised you the most when writing this book? Oh, that's such a good question. I think I was, hmm, I, you know, I think I was really surprised by how integral the library became in the research. I, I worked in a room called the Allen Room where if you have a book contract, you can work in there and you get books delivered right to your bookshelf. And the, the librarians were so helpful. Whenever I had a question, they, they had fantastic resources and answers. And just the, the idea that I could go in and look through the archives of the superintendent 
and just boxes of, of books with payroll and you know who worked for him and what he did and letters of complaint that really helped to humanize my characters in a lot of ways. And so really, I was surprised. It was the first time that the building became not only the source of inspiration, but but the location for me to actually work in. And that was so cool. That is so cool. I hadn't even thought about that component of it, that you were actually writing about it while you were in there. That's very neat, or researching, or however you were working on it. Yeah, it was great. And I remember at one point, I in an early draft, I had a dead body. It's not there now, but I did have a dead <laughs> body. And I reached out to one of my librarians, and I said, you know, where would you hide a dead body in the library? And she wrote back to me an email saying, oh, here, here's where you should put it. <laughs> Like she and, constantly thought about it. She's like, I already have the answer to that question. <laughs> she responded right away. And, and she did say that she'd never gotten that question before. So, <laughs> you know, there's a little book, you know, I work at Murder by the Book. And um, last Christmas we had, last holiday season, we had a little book that was questions that the New York Public Library had received in their answers. And I love that. I gave it to so many people as gifts. I thought it was so funny to see some of the questions that they'd encountered. I, I didn't make it all the way through it. I have to see if your question is in there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's great. And, and that was fun for me because Sadie in the 1990s section started out as a, re- a reference librarian and, and got all these questions. And so it was fun to research some and take some that were real and give them to Sadie and have her figure them out. Because they're, you know, one was, when did the Statue of Liberty turn green? And (laughs) and they can figure that out. (laughs) I just think that's so cool. And, you know, it's interesting, and I don't see it as much anymore, but I think when there was the first move online, eBooks, some of that, people started kind of saying, not everyone, some people, that libraries really aren't necessary anymore. And then there was a huge pushback, and I think libraries are obviously very necessary. But it's so nice to hear your story, because clearly, if the library wasn't there, that would have altered dramatically what you're doing. Right. Oh, no question. And also talking to librarians like Jean Ashton, who was an inspiration in my book, who worked at Columbia University during that, that theft. And, and she talked about how libraries are really the safekeepers of these artifacts of the past. And the New York Public Library is one of those libraries. And, and these, these artifacts, you know, their value fluctuates over time, but, but you, you just can't tell the value on X number of pages worth X that Things that were really dismissed 100 years ago, like women's diaries or records of slave transactions, are really valuable today because our our way of thinking has evolved. And that libraries, again, are, are the ones who keep these things safe for us so that when we do realize their value, they're ready. Right, because those things are not, there's no way to replace them. So it is very nice that someone has them and holds on to them. Um, I loved that book by Susan Orlean, the library book about the LA public library and the saving of the books. Um, So no, I do. And I think that there's been, a, a kind of a swing back and now people understand the importance of libraries and I think they've bobbed and weaved and they do different things now too. I mean, obviously the New York Public Library is different because they're holding on to all these artifacts, but even just your local library, they, they do a lot for the community and it's nice to see that they've kind of withstood the initial push for things to move online a lot more. Yeah, I agree. And they offer so much for the community, not just books and, and reading or, or story time for kids. They offer so many programs, including author talks and reading series and lessons on, on the computer. There's just so much out there. If people just look and explore it, I think they'll be pretty surprised. I agree. And I feel like there's been a good campaign about that in the last five or years or so. So people are now much more supportive. But you know, when you first started hearing that, I was like, I can't get rid of libraries. <laughs> so I think it's nice that, that that has moved forward positively. Yes. What was the highlight of writing this book? Ooh, the highlight. Oh, I, I think it was probably getting the mystery element to work because again, you're working in two timelines and going back and forth and, and you need to surprise the reader yet, yet the answer to the mystery needs to feel inevitable. And so once I, once I realized I figured that out and, and it was clear to me that was probably the most surprising because for a while there, I wasn't sure if I could pull it off. <laughs> well, you did very well. I thought the resolution in this one was just fabulous. So right. I know that takes a lot of time and effort and work to get it to work together, but it came out perfectly. Thank you. So I always ask about the titles because I, you know, I love titles and covers. I think your title is, is pretty self-explanatory, but tell me how the title came about. 
Yeah. So I am terrible at titles <laughs> and my agent, and my editor will both tell you that I'll send them ideas and they're just awful. Um, I just, I can write a 90,000 word book, but I cannot come up with a five word title. And so they've come up with, my agent has come up with every title for every book. And this last one, she and my editor both came up with this one at the same time, the lions of fifth Avenue. Wow. And the minute that they did, I realized that I would change the last name of my characters from it was a different name and oh, to Lions L Y O N S because I thought oh that's wonderful because we're talking not about not only about the iconic lions patience and fortitude but also this family that lives inside the building. Oh, I love that. Well, I just think it's the perfect title, but also your cover. I always love your covers, and it's just so much fun to see them. But this one is just fabulous. Yeah, they did a wonderful job, and and you know the minute I saw it with the the black and white background and this girl in a yellow dress on, in the front, I was so excited, and to the point where her dress is kind of like a 1950s vintage dress, and the minute I saw that, I thought, well, it's not exactly the right time period, but I'll make my character Sadie, who's in the 1990s, love vintage clothes because she's someone who's out of step with her time. She loves rare books. She loves vintage clothes. She doesn't quite fit in to modern day. And so it was a really great source of inspiration for the character. And I went back and added in that she's a vintage clothes maniac and suddenly it all came together. <laughs> That's fun. I did not know that. That's really neat. I, mean, I knew she was a loved vintage clothes, but I didn't realize that that inspiration had come from the cover. That's really cool. Yeah, it really is a collaboration. There is no question, these books, because, you know, I, I have an, an amazing team weighing in on, on the, the raw product of the book and, and helping me shape it and market it and the publicity. And it's been just such a wonderful team effort these past five years. I, I couldn't be more lucky. Do you have a favorite of your books or a favorite character that you've written? Oh, you know, that, that's tough to pick. I, I think it's whatever book I'm focused on right now. And The Lions of Fifth Avenue definitely just seems to be striking a chord with readers in a way that just warms my heart. And I, I love Sadie. She's such a quirky duck. And, and I love writing characters with a really interesting arc um, where they start out one way and end up another. And, and she fulfills that. No, I agree. And I do think, I guess it's, I don't know if it's the books or what it is, but I do think that really it resonates, you know, I guess it's about a library and books resonates with readers so much. Yeah, I, I think so. Well, are you working on anything new that you can tell me about? Sure. I'm working on a book set at the Frick Collection. Oh, I can tell that you know I it. love the back. Frick. <laughs> oh, and my mom loves the Frick. When, when we normally can travel to New York, we have been there so many times. Oh, that makes me so excited. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah, it's, it's kind of an unknown gem. It's not a big showstopper like the Met or the New York Public Library. It's, it's a, it was the mansion of Henry Clay Frick and his family um, during the Gilded Age. And then after his wife died, it became a, a museum. And so I love the fact that it was a home and a museum, and I'm playing with both of those aspects of it. Well, I think that's what makes it so neat, is that it is, it's, it's a home with the art in it, but you still have some of the, the furniture and things like that from it. So it's just such a fun place to tour. Are you going to do a dual timeline, or are you that far along yet? Yep, dual timeline. Yep, and I think it'll be um, 1919 and the 1960s. Oh, I can't wait already. That's so exciting. <laughs> what do you like to do when you're not reading or writing? Ooh, um, I like to lie in a hammock and read. Oh, that's reading. Wait. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, it's kind I, of relaxing too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I love to go for a run or a walk. I have a vegetable garden that I've been planting that's overrun with weeds that really needs to be weeded and that kind of thing. And, and just catching up with friends when I can. I think it's so important to stay socially connected to people right now. So I'm doing that as much as I can, even if it's virtual. Well, and I think that has been a silver lining of this pandemic is that people have learned a lot more of these um, online things like Zoom and various ways to connect. So obviously in person is always the best, but I found that I'm keeping up better with some of my college roommates who are across the country and things like that via Zoom than we ever did before. So that part's at least nice. It's true. And, and even more interesting for authors, this idea of, of virtual chats, you reach so many people who you otherwise would not know if you were going on book tour and went to a bookstore and met 100 people. I do miss the signing line where you get to spend, you know, a minute or two with each person. But but just the the way readers have been responding to all the chats that that my author friends are doing 
is really kind of wonderful. And, and I hope expanding people's minds in terms of what's out there to read. And I think that that will be something that continues. Hopefully when we're back to whatever the new normal is and authors can tour, I would bet there'll be some combination of in-person tours and more of these online events because people have gotten so comfortable doing them and understand better what they can do and and love seeing, like you said, authors that you wouldn't necessarily see on tour because they're not coming to your city. Yeah, I guess there's a silver lining. Well, we'll we'll keep (laughs) keep an eye on. I know, I'm trying to focus on the positive. I know. Well, before we wrap up, I always like to ask what your favorite recommended reads are. Do you have any books that you've read lately that you really like? Yes. All right. The Daughters of Foxcote Manor is a book by Eve Chase. It just came out and it's wonderful. It's dual timeline. There's a crumbling English um, manor house. It's beautifully written and you cannot put it down. Um, The Book of Lost Names by Kristen Harmel is, is fantastic as well. Um, And just hit the New York Times bestseller list. So that's exciting. I was just going to say that. I saw that this morning. I really want to read that book. And I have, I really want to read both of them because I'd seen you post about the Eve Chase book. So I need to pick it up. And then I've got the other one on from NetGalley, but I haven't gotten to it yet. But I was so excited for her. Yes, I know. So well deserved. That that book just made me cry. It's, It's beautiful. And then there's a book coming out September 1st called 50 Words for Rain by Asha Lemmy, L E M M I E. She's a debut author. And it's post-World War II Japan from the point of view of a girl who is half Black and half Japanese. And it's a unique story and really powerful. And so I'm, I'm trying to, to get that one out there so people, people go out and buy it. I haven't even heard of that. I'm so excited to look that one up. It sounds fascinating. Yeah. And, and also, have you heard of The Exiles by Christina Baker Klein? I, I like her and I saw that it was coming. I have not read it yet, but I loved The Orphan Train. Yeah. So yes, I saw that. And, and in the cover on The Exiles is fabulous, but I haven't read it yet. Is it good? It's so good. And again, a really unique story. It takes place in Australia. It's just, it, and it's, she's such a good writer. So yeah, those are four of, four of my very top picks. Oh, well, those all sound fabulous. My parents actually lived in Australia after I was grown, but I would go visit them. And so anything that takes place in Australia, I'm always looking forward to reading. Yeah, it made me want to go see it. It's, <laughs> it's a beautiful place. So, well, I can't thank you enough. I always love talking to you and I had so much fun hearing more about the Lions of Fifth Avenue today. And I really appreciate your time. Oh, thank you for having me. And, and thanks for everything you do to, to help us get the word out. We, all of us authors truly appreciate it. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. If you liked this episode, and I hope you did, please follow me on Instagram at Thoughts From a Page. Tell all of your friends about the podcast and rate it wherever you listen. I would really appreciate it. Fiona's book can be purchased at Murder by the Book, where I work part time, and the link is in the show notes. Thanks to KP Regan for the sound editing, and I really hope to see you next time. Hello, podcast fans. Want to get weird with us? Come check out the Mad Scientist podcast. We are a weekly show that looks at the history, philosophy, and hard facts behind your biggest paranormal questions. Did the government really pay for a psychic spy program? Yes. Is it true that surgery got its start in grave robbing? Yes. Can a roller coaster really kill you? Legally, we can't say so for sure, but sometimes, yes! Join myself, Chris Cogswell, and my co-host, Marie Mayhew, as we examine the science, philosophy, and history behind the strange and unusual. All to discover what's possible and plausible versus what's, well, just made up. Check us out wherever you find your favorite podcasts. The Mad Scientist Podcast.